Well, good morning. Uh, I'm so glad to be with you this morning. My name is Pastor Jim Baugh. I'm with Global Training Network. <clears throat> and uh, we exist to train and equip indigenous leaders and pastors globally. And I have the joy of being with you today as we open the scripture. Uh, this morning, we're going to be in Acts chapter 2, uh, verses 41 through 47. In view of the recent Super Bowl, in which uh, we had uh, the Kansas City Chiefs overcome the uh, Philadelphia Eagles, what a game. Uh, some people say it was robbed, and some people say, no, the calls were great. But we do know this, there's only one individual who got the award, who got the championship, and uh, that was the Chiefs. So congratulations. But what does it take to become a championship church, a church that really exalts the Lord Jesus, gives honor to him, is in essence, uh, if you had a four-cylinder engine, it's firing on all four cylinders. If you had a stool, it's got all four, four uh, legs of the stool intact. And it's able to accomplish the very purpose for which God intended. What is the church? Um, Acts chapter 2, verse 41 to 47 <clears throat> gives us a clear idea of, I would call it God's template for a championship church. In Acts chapter 2, the background of the passage is the Spirit of God promised by Jesus in John chapter 14 and other passages where he said, I will send the paraclete, the helper, and he will come. And he will not only be with you, he will be in you. And he will accomplish things in you and through you that you never thought possible. He is the teacher, the encourager, the leader, the God, the Holy Spirit. And so in Acts chapter 2, we see after the Spirit of God came upon the church in what's often called the baptism of the church, or the beginning of the church, where the Holy Spirit did in fact come to indwell the hearts and lives of every believer, that Peter went out to preach. And the, uh, the invitation to the message was, repent, be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, because of the forgiveness of sin. I know your translations say for, but most likely it's, uh, it's, it's a causal statement, because, be baptized because your sins have been forgiven. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promises for you and for your children, for all who are afar off, everyone whom the Lord God calls to himself. And with the other words, he, he called them and, and uh, he said, save yourselves from this crooked generation. And then we find the result. So those who received his word were baptized. They were added that day about 3,000 souls. And here's, this is, this is the church, the ecclesia. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 16, after Peter's confession that you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said, upon this rock, upon this confession, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Jesus said, I will build my church. The church was not in existence yet. It came into existence in Acts chapter two. Now the word church means, or is in the original uh, language of the Greek, uh, ekklesia, which is a compound word. Ek means out and klesia means to call. They were those whom God had called unto himself. Just as Paul, or excuse me, Peter writes in verse 39, um, this promise is for you and for your children, for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. That's a great definition of the church. Those whom God has called to himself and those who by faith have responded to that call. So what happened in that early church that made it a championship church, the template? And God says this in, in Acts chapter 2, verse 42, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayers, and awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common, and they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all, as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with gladness, glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Great passage. Let's pray together. Father, in Jesus' name, 
We come boldly before your throne. We thank you for your word, and we pray you teach us now by the power of the Holy Spirit. Encourage those hearts who are discouraged this morning. Uh, challenge those who need to be challenged, Lord, and just bring the teaching of your word to our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, God's template or God's plan for his championship church. By the way, isn't this a beautiful background? We just had snow last night and it's a little chilly, but I thought I'd just let the Lord's landscape be our background this morning. Um, yeah, so what is the template for God's champion church? What are the four ingredients that make up a church that accomplishes everything that God has called it to do? Now, we know the statistics. Our news media is telling us that the church is in decline, that people are not attending church anymore. And some of those statistics are true. As a result of COVID, uh, some 30% of people who were a part of a local church have not returned. Uh, some of it be due to health issues, some of it just due to lack of commitment. And I want to talk about commitment because commitment begins the four legs of each uh, leg of the of each stool of God's church, the four things that that will bring championship to any local church. And I, I also want to say this is that God's church is very much alive. Everywhere in the Bible, the church is not spoken of as a building. It's spoken of as a body. It's not spoken of as a steeple. A steeple. It's it's spoken of as a people. So um, the church is alive. It may exhibit itself in different forms, but we do know that wherever the body of Christ is gathered together, and there are established leaderships and uh, leadership, and they're uh, observing the Lord's Supper and baptism as the two ordinances of the church, then that's a church, okay? So uh, what makes a championship church? Going back to my original question. There are four commitments. And before I get into those commitments, I want to talk about commitment because there's different levels of commitment. I mean, when we say, man, I'm committed, um, it may mean what in relationship to context? If, if a, an athlete says, I'm committed to come to practice every week, well, that, does that mean he's committed to work hard at the practice? Um, there's, I would classify commitment in two ways in relationship to ministry. There's the commitment of service, and there's also the commitment of sacrifice. The commitment of service could be illustrated like this in sacrifice. Think for a minute, Mrs. Chicken, is in her coop and she's talking to Mr. Pig about breakfast. And she says, I'm committed to provide breakfast for Farmer John every single morning. And the pig said, you call that commitment? I'd call that a commitment of service. But whenever I give breakfast to Farmer John, it's a commitment of sacrifice. <laughs> and that's so true. Are you committed not only to serve in God's local church to serve the Lord, but all you're willing, if that commitment calls for it, to sacrifice. Just like Stephen did. I mean, I'm not calling for martyrs here this morning, but I am calling for God's people to be witnesses of the things that they have heard and experienced in as a result of having a relationship with Jesus. I mean, too many Christians are like the Arctic River. We're closed at the mouth and nothing comes out. Stuff comes in, but nothing comes out. And here we go. There's first the commitment to the word. God's church was committed to the word. In Acts 2.42, it says they were committed to the apostles' teaching. Now, what is the apostles' teaching? Well, it continued in Acts chapter 2 <clears throat> to include the books of the apostle Paul, Peter, John, um, Acts, which is written by Luke, who was a, a Gentile who was called by God under the inspiration of God, to write the word of God. There are many authors in the New Testament and they were all inspired literally by God. Second, uh, Second Timothy chapter three, verse 16 and 17 tells us what scripture is, <clears throat> where it says all scripture, the word there is pantas. It means all, every bit from Genesis one all the way through to Genesis chapter 21. All scripture is given to us by inspiration of God. 
Now that word inspiration in the Greek language is the word theosnuptos, and it's the only time this word is used in the New Testament. And it literally means this, the breath of God. All scripture is literally the breath of God. Have you ever had this experience where someone's trying to tell you a secret? They say, hey, come here, come here, come here. I got something I got to tell you, I got to tell you. And your guy like, you can't tell me here. We're in a library. And the guy says, I just want, just come here. And they say, stop, 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 stop. And you can feel that breath on the hairs of your ear. You kind of go, oh. And that's that word, theos, theos nuptos. It's literally the, the breath of God. God says, come here, I want to tell you something. I want to tell you something very intimate between me and you. And, and I want you to listen. All scripture is that way for us. It is God speaking to us and speaking to his people in the original context and telling us how that truth applies to our life today, right? And they were committed to the apostles' teaching. They were committed to what Peter taught. They were committed to <clears throat> eventually what, <clears throat> what the apostle Paul taught, what John taught, what Matthew taught. In John 17, 17, Jesus says this, and he's, his prayer to God the Father, he says, sanctify them in thy truth. Thy word is truth. Do you believe the Bible to be the word of God, the truth? Sadly, many Christians today say, well, I, I think it's probably a great book with a lot of great sayings, and it's got some good stories that we can teach morality, but it's, it's not inspired by God, it's, and it's not inerrant. I mean, science and scripture conflict, don't they? Oh, do they? I believe that the Bible is not a science textbook, but everything in the Bible I believe to be the Word of God. I understand it to be God's inspired Word. And whatever God says to me, I believe it. I agree with it. Regardless of what men say, because the Bible tells us that all men are liars, but God cannot lie, and God will not lie to you. Are you discouraged and defeated? Looking at all the things that are happening in the world today? Open the Word of God and let God bring his comfort to you through his word. Not only believe it, not only be committed to it, but be committed to do what it says. The Bible says in James 1.22 that <clears throat> if a man reads the word but doesn't heed its contents, in other words, he doesn't do what God tells him to do, then he's deceived himself. He's like a man who wakes up in the morning, got a little breeze here, like a man who wakes up in the morning and looks at himself in a mirror and having seen himself walks away thinking, I don't need to change anything. And he deceives himself. Men and women, the word of God is like a mirror to us and it shows us where we've sinned and where we have obeyed and what we need to do and what we must not do. We're called to read the word. We're called to heed the word. We're called to study the word. We're called to obey the word. Don't be like the guy who wakes, wakes up in the morning and you know what it's like. You wake up, you got eye stuff in your eyes and maybe your nose is a little crusty and your hair is sticking all every which way but loose and you just say, hmm, look really good. I'm going to work. No, you take time to clean, to wash, to make sure that things are in place and that's what God calls us to do with his word. They were committed to the word. The first thing, Thing, first commitment of any local church is commitment to the word. Second commitment is committed to worship. In Acts 2.42, it says, <clears throat> verse, verse 43, And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together. There was that aspect of unity and, and oneness in their worship. You know, if we're not committed to the word, then we will not understand who the God is we're called to worship. You see the significance there? In John chapter 4, verse 22 through 23, where Jesus is speaking to the Samaritan woman, and, and he says, <clears throat> well, she asks him this question, you know, where should we worship? Should we worship in Jerusalem? We worship here in Samaria. And Jesus says, 
you worship what you don't know. And he says, as, a, as, as the Messiah, we worship what we know. We, we know the true living Yahweh God. But God is spirit. And those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in what? Truth. I mean, it's one thing to get all excited in, in your worship. But <clears throat> if your worship is not based on truth, it's false worship. Every year, there's Filipino uh, professing believers who crucify themselves on a cross and around Easter time to show God how penitent they are for their sin. You know something? Driving a nail through my wrist will not wash away any sin because the King of kings and the Lord of lords already did it for me on the cross. In essence, when we attempt to do things to uh, enable God to love us more, we're saying what Jesus did on the cross is insufficient. And I'll tell you this, the blood of Jesus keeps on cleansing us from all sin. And when I know I'm forgiven, when I know who I am in Christ, my worship is without limits. We worship the God that we know. I'll never forget a woman said, if you don't know the word of God, you'll never know the God to whom you long to worship. So committed to the word, committed to worship, to praise God, to give all worth and glory and honor and praise to the one who saved us by his grace. God is worship. God is truth. God is spirit, and we must worship him in, in spirit and in truth. The third principle is committed to one another. Committed to one another. The Bible says in Acts chapter 2 that they devoted themselves, committed themselves to the apostles' teaching and to what? Fellowship. They were devoted to fellowship. Now, one is once uh, stated, you know, what is fellowship? Well, it's two fellows in the same ship. And that lacks, you know, the impact of the word. But literally, fellowship is individuals who enjoy one another's company and they're on the same journey together, and they're thankful for the opportunity to live together, to serve together, to worship together. Are you in fellowship with your brothers and sisters in Christ? One of the first <clears throat> steps towards spiritual decline is to remove yourself from fellowship. The Bible tells us in Acts, or excuse me, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24 and 25, do not forsake the assembling of yourselves with God's people is the habit of some. And you know, the, the first thing that happens in our lives when we fall out of fellowship with God is we fall out of fellowship with one another. Now I thank God for technology that you can be in your home and we can join together in worship and teaching of the word of God. But I wanna encourage you in this, don't, don't, uh, separate yourself from the fellowship of the family of God and meet with them as you are able to. Sometimes health prohibits and we under God knows that, but be in fellowship, whether it be in prayer, over the telephone, in contact, so that the light of your faith does not grow dim. One day there was a man in Charles Spurgeon's congregation and Spurgeon was a famous preacher in London. In fact, there were over 5,000 people who listened to Charles Spurgeon before they had microphones. Can you imagine the acoustics in that building? And, uh, but Spurgeon was also a shepherd, not only a teacher, but a shepherd. And he knew there was one brother in the congregation that he had not seen for a number of weeks. And so Pastor Spurgeon went out to find the lost sheep of his flock. And he knocked on the door of the home and the man came to the door and rather sheepishly seeing Pastor Spurgeon said, well, hello, brother. Come on in. Come on into the house. And Pastor Spurgeon came in and greeted him and sat in the chair next to him in front of a roaring fire. And without saying anything, Pastor Spurgeon went to the fire and grabbed the little prongs, you know, the little things to grab a piece of wood out. And he, he grabbed that wood and he put it on the fire brick. And then he sat down and they both looked at that piece of wood that was once blazing and it lost its flame and began to turn black and cold. And after about 15 minutes, can you imagine the suspense? 
Pastor Spurgeon looked at the man and said, my brother, the only reason why I'm here is to tell you that you're loved and you're missed. And if you don't join back in with the fellowship of the faith, your faith will grow as cold as that piece of coal in front of us. And the man said, Pastor, thank you so much for coming. I'll be there. Are you committed to the fellowship? Verse 44, it says they were sharing with one another. Verse 45 says that they were, they were caring for each other. They were selling the possessions and belongings and distributing the needs. They were giving. Verse 46, they were opening their homes to one another. They met in the temple <clears throat> on the Lord's day, and then they would meet in homes during the week. And it says they received their food with glad and generous hearts, breaking bread in their homes. And some people say, well, that was communion. And I'm not going to uh, say that's not a possibility, but actually it is a possibility. They were also breaking bread. They were having meals together. They were sharing together. One thing that is a part of the local church that needs to be, in essence, reinvested in is our love for one another, our care for one another pastor once wisely told me that people will come where the action is, but they'll stay where the love is. Are there people in your congregation that perhaps you've divided in your fellowship from them because of unforgiveness in your own heart? You know, unforgiveness is kind of like the prison cell that keeps us from walking free in our relationship with Christ. Unforgiveness is like the dagger that someone inadvertently plunged in our spiritual heart. And instead of removing the dagger and forgiving the, the offense, we stand and twist the dagger in our heart trying to show the person who offended us how angry we are with them and how hurt we are. The Bible tells us very clearly in John 13, 31, by this will all men know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. My friends, unforgiveness does not flow free in the heart of a Christian. There is a barrenness and bitterness that we need to repent of before God can begin his work in us again and through us. There is no perfect church and there are no perfect people. I heard a pastor once tell me, hey, Jim, sheep bite. <laughs> and they do. My dad also told me one time, Jim, if you want to be a pastor, be prepared for a broken heart and I have but I'll tell you this I will not be imprisoned by failing to forgive those who have hurt me and I know that there is hurt out there you're sitting there and you say I maybe you have hurt and anger towards an ex or maybe you have hurt and anger towards your husband or your wife or maybe someone in the church or maybe a pastor from the past I'll tell you this that unforgiveness will keep you in the chains of bitterness. The Bible says they were committed to one another, and that means not only loving one another, but also the evidence of love, which is seen in forgiveness. I encourage you to examine your heart today, even as you would before the Lord's table in communion, to see if there's any offense in you that has divided your heart away from other believers and reconnect in the fellowship. The final point I want to bring to you this morning is the final commitment, is that they were committed to win others to Christ. This championship church was committed to the word. They were committed to worship. They were committed to one another, and they were committed to win others to Christ. In verse 41, we see the direct evidence of the Holy Spirit's ministry that those who received his word, the apostle Peter, were baptized and they were added that day about 3,000 souls. Can you imagine that kind of statistic for church growth? Can you imagine how excited you'd be? Can you imagine how angry you might be? Because that person that is now sitting in your favorite chair has also parked in your favorite parking spot. <laughs> but when you're committed to win souls to Christ, it doesn't matter. A full church is a wonderful problem to have. A full parking lot is a wonderful problem to have. They were committed to winning others to Christ. And it says, and just to reiterate that, in verse 47, it says they were praising God. Remember, they're filled with worship. They're committed to worship and having favor with all the people. Jesus said this 
when he was asked what the greatest commandment is, Jesus said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. In these two commandments, summarize all the law and the prophets. Loving God and loving one another is the prerequisite to walking in obedience in the kingdom. Committed to winning others to Christ. It says that the Lord added, their, added that day to their number those who were being saved. Every day, the Lord was bringing new people to faith in Christ. The church was growing. The church was exploding. Remember I said earlier that um, our news media is telling us that the church is, is going under and there's nobody a part of the church anymore. And I'll tell you this, the church is growing profoundly around the world. In Africa, every day someone meets Jesus. Not just someone, 10,000 someones meet Jesus. Every day in South and Central America, 10,000 someones meet Jesus. Every day in Asia, 25,000 in India, 30,000 to 40,000 in China. Around the world, people are coming to faith. In North America, the statistics are not as much. About 4,000 people come to faith every single day. But I'll tell you this, Jesus promised he would build his church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Notice he said, I will build my church. He didn't say I will build a church or he will build the church. He said he would build his church. And the first point of, of having a church that is his involves every member of it saying, I belong to Christ and he belongs to me. Do you belong to Christ? Do you know the Lord Jesus? Have you been added to that church by faith in Christ alone? Have you come to that place in your spiritual life that you know, I'm right with God and God is right with me because I've trusted his perfect sacrifice for my sin. The Lord Jesus who died on the cross, he was buried and he rose again from the dead. My friend, this is the, the template for God's championship church committed to the word, committed to worship, committed to one another, committed to winning others to Christ. You say, I don't know how to win others to Christ. I'll, I'll give you a little hint. Start with prayer. Go to your friends, your neighbors, and say, I believe in the power of prayer. Is there anything that I could pray for you about as a follower of Christ? And I'll guarantee you that God will open up those conversations. The second thing is to develop your testimony, how you met Christ and what's happened since you've met Christ. I do it this way, before I met Christ, when I met Christ, and now that I know Christ. Those are three steps of a template or a, a testimony worksheet that you could do to fill out and say, you know, before I met Christ, I had no assurance of eternal life. But someone shared the good news of Jesus with me and I put my trust in him and he gave me that free gift. And now that I know Christ, I know that my future is secure and that I can follow the Lord and know that my life is in his hands. Do you have that peace in your heart too? May I share with you how I came to know that peace with God through faith in Christ. Those four elements make up a championship church. And just like a stool that's missing a couple legs, if you don't have all four of them, you're imbalanced. So let's review them again. A commitment to the word of God. A commitment to worship, a commitment to one another, and a commitment to win others to Jesus Christ. This is the championship playbook for a championship church and a believer who's a part of a championship team. May God bless you. May he encourage your hearts. May he strengthen you as you seek to walk in fellowship with him, committed to his word, committed to worship, committed to your brothers and sisters and committed to share your story with others, to win others to Christ. May God bless you this week. May he encourage you. May he strengthen your heart to spend time daily in this book. By the way, one week without the Bible makes one week, W-E-A-K. I want to encourage you in your commitment to the word is just begin by reading the gospel of John, a chapter a day, and asking God to show you five things in that chapter about God, about Jesus, about 
what he wants you to do and write those five things down and then say, okay, how can I apply one of these truths to my life? And as you work through the Gospel of John, God will teach you, he will equip you as you are committed to his word and you'll begin worshiping him even more um, biblically and gloriously. May God bless you. I'll pray as I close. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you for every brother and sister who's here today listening, and I pray that you would encourage their hearts to be that champion player in your champion church. In Jesus' name, I pray, amen. Hey, it's starting to snow. God bless you. Bye-bye.